Here's a simple question for you. How many computers are in your home? If your answer is less than 10, my response is, are you sure? To be clear, I'm not just talking about laptops and desktops. I'm including things that probably weren't in your home five or 10 years ago, like smart thermostats, smart cameras, smart lighting, Amazon Echoes, and plenty of other smart devices. Now there's an interesting thing about most of these relatively new computing devices, and that's the fact that the majority of them are continuously connected to the cloud to support features such as remotely controlling smart lighting from devices like your smartphone or your Amazon Echo. Okay, let's consider the backend systems you'd need to support all of these continuously connected devices. So do you think your software development tools would support building these types of massively concurrent systems? If you use any of the most popular languages, well, you might be able to pull this off, but odds are it's gonna be pretty painful, and I would suggest you probably aren't using the best tools for these types of jobs. Okay, so what's a better tool? Well, I'll answer this with a hypothetical scenario. Let me explain. Imagine you're working at a company that's creating a new smart thermostat. The smart thermostat you're creating has a few important requirements. They must be remotely controllable, they must be very responsive, they must be as reliable as a dumb thermostat, and it should mostly work offline, and they should have low operating costs because the only revenue you'll get is from a one-time retail purchase. We'll come back to these requirements in a moment. Now, the expectation is that shortly after launch, there will be around 100,000 thermostats online, and there could be more than a million in the first year. Okay, I wanna pause for a moment and address this example. I don't want you to get too hung up on this specific example. Obviously, most of you aren't going to be working on smart thermostats, but the concepts we're about to look at are widely applicable to other scenarios where massive concurrency is needed, so hang with me, because you might just see a solution that applies to your specific challenges as well. All right, let me describe how this smart thermostat system should work. Basically, the thermostats will be connected to Wi-Fi and it will initiate a continuous connection to our servers. Now, we need this continuous connection to support remote access and control. So with this basic understanding of how the system should work, I'll ask again, will the software development languages and tools you know work well for this type of massive concurrency scenario? If you're not sure, then the answer is probably no, but stick with me and let me explain why I'm saying this. There's an underused programming model that's designed specifically for the type of problem I've just described, and it's called the actor model. So what is the actor model? Well, as the name suggests, there are actors, which are really just processes, kind of like threads in other languages, with a few significant differences that I'll highlight right now. First of all, processes are lightweight when compared to threads, meaning they typically use significantly less memory. Processes are almost completely isolated in that they have their own private memory, garbage collector, mailbox, and some other things, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Now, these processes can either be short-lived, meaning they're created to perform some task, and on completion, the process dies, or the process can be long-lived and could run indefinitely. Another important feature of processes is that they're preemptively scheduled. So for example, if you have four processes with different amounts of work to do, each of these processes will be guaranteed a fair usage of CPU time, which results in a more responsive system. Okay, so what can you do with processes? Well, you can almost think of processes as small, isolated applications that can interact with any other process by passing messages. So for example, let's say our smartphone app sends a request to the server, which is handled by a new server process, but to create a response, we've got to communicate with this thermostat via this process. Now, these two processes can interact with each other by passing messages, but you might be wondering, what exactly do I mean by messages? Well, a message consists of two things, a payload and a destination address. Now the message is delivered to the receiving process's mailbox, then the receiving process pulls the message out of the mailbox, and then based on the payload, it can do the following things. It can spawn another process to do some work. It can change the state of the process, because remember, processes have their own private memory. It can make local decisions. So for example, it could forward the request down to the connected thermostat. And of course, this process can generate a response message. Okay, at this point, you should have a very basic sense of how the actor model works, but you might still be wondering, what's the point? I mean, why would you choose this model of programming? Well, hang with me, and it'll start to make sense in a moment here. So what if an actor has a bug that results in an unexpected error? 
Well, unlike most programming paradigms, with the actor model you don't program defensively in regard to unexpected errors. Instead, when there's an unexpected error, you just let the process crash and die. Ok, I bet some of you are thinking, this sounds kind of irresponsible, but keep an open mind and hear me out. If you think about it, what would you even do with an unexpected error? I mean, if it's unexpected, you didn't anticipate it, right? And you can't really recover from something you didn't anticipate. So instead of trying to catch the unexpected error and deal with it somehow, why not just let the process crash and maybe try to log some useful information? But here's the important part. You can have another process supervise the process that crashed, and then the supervising process can restart the crash process with a known good working state. And oh, by the way, because processes are isolated, this crash process has no effect on these other processes. They just keep on running. Ok, I want to turn our focus back to our example and I've got a question for you. How many servers do you think we'll need to support 100,000 connected thermostats? Well, remember, processes are lightweight and it's very common to have hundreds of thousands or even millions of concurrently running processes on a single server. So technically, you could handle 100,000 thermostats with one server and you'd have plenty of headroom for growth, but do you see a problem with having just one server? Well, the problem is, using just one server wouldn't provide you the high availability you need because it represents a single point of failure, so you should probably have at least two servers. Ok, so how do you go from one server to two or more servers? Well, fortunately, systems that implement the actor model have inherent support for clustering of servers, or nodes. All you need to do is name each node, provide a shared secret, and make one function call to connect the nodes. Now, since node A and node B are clustered, you can create processes on both nodes, and you can pass messages between these processes just as you would with local processes. What I've just described is called the distributed actor model. At first glance, distributed actors might seem pretty easy because it's a native feature and you can implement the hello world of distributed actors in a matter of minutes, but I don't want to mislead you in this regard. Just because you can easily create a cluster doesn't mean you've created a scalable and fault tolerant system that works the way you need it to. So for example, let's say you've got a bunch of processes running on each of these nodes and then there's a hardware issue here and the server crashes. So do you see a problem with this scenario? The problem is, any state in these processes is lost. However, you could create a more resilient system by replicating these processes to the other servers, thus eliminating the single point of failure. Another challenge with clustering is that nodes can be a bit chatty, and clusters by default are a fully connected mesh, so you can only add so many nodes before you start to run into scaling issues. An even bigger challenge is handling network partitions. So for example, let's say you've got five nodes in your cluster and a network partition occurs here. This is what's called the split brain situation, and according to CAP theorem, when a partition occurs, you have to choose between consistency or availability, and you have to design your systems accordingly. Ok, so there are challenges with the distributed actor model, I mean, it's not easy, but it does provide excellent building blocks to solve these challenges, especially compared to the alternatives. I want to dig into these last two requirements. So how can we further address these? Well, in regards to operating costs, you can try and minimize the network traffic between the thermostats and the servers, and you can try to reduce the load on the server by minimizing how much memory each process uses, and I guess you could try to minimize how much CPU time each process needs, but honestly, there's only so much you can do in this regard. An interesting solution that would support both offline mode at the thermostat and reduce operating costs would be to expand what we're calling distributed actors. What I mean is, what if we said the thermostat is also a distributed actor, then you could push some of the CPU and memory usage to the device, and you could potentially use efficient diffing algorithms to synchronize state, and since the thermostat is an actor, it would seamlessly work in an offline mode. Now everything I've described about distributed actors here is something you can do today. In fact, you've been able to use this distributed actor model for more than three decades with Erlang and its virtual machine. And there's also Elixir, which is a modern language that also uses the beam. But this part here, where I talked about pushing the distributed actor down to the thermostat, isn't a solved problem yet, but it's something we're working on here at Mycelial. If you're interested in what we're doing, please sign up for our mailing list at mycelial.com.